Hi everyone, my name is uh, Per. Uh, by daytime I uh, do wear a jacket and a shirt and I have the title of security officer for Lloyd Choice Hotels. And in my spare time I do absolutely everything you can imagine about passwords and, and digital authentication. And um, I'm going to talk for the, the first part of, of my talk is going to be about DNS and email security. Yeah, I'll, I'll be more practical than on my leader. And the second part will uh, be about passwords. And then my first question is, uh, are there anyone here that listened to my passwords talk for Uvas in Gothenburg in 2014? <laughs> <coughs> came back. What's wrong with you people? It's, okay. Good. Well, the good news for you, those of you that have listened to me before talk about passwords, I have made new jokes since the last time I was here. And I even have new slides as well, so it's not going to be the same thing over again. A lot of things have happened in five years. But first of all, uh, DNS and email security. Um, and I do have to apologize, My, these slides are in Norwegian, I'm not going to read all the text, and so you don't have to read all the text either, I will do it, of course, uh, speaking in, in English. First of all, let's start, start, start out with email. At Knowledge Choice Hotels, we send out more than two million emails, somewhere between two and a half and three million to be exact, every week. That's a lot of email, and yes, quite a few of those emails are what we usually call spam. Of course, I have to say marketing emails that you asked for specifically, but it is spam. And email today, just like it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is a system that we use to communicate internally and externally with all kinds of people. We use email to transfer files. If you want to transfer a file today, in a way, the best way to do that, or the most common way to transfer a file on the internet today, is to send it as an email attachment. Because not everybody is using WhatsApp, or Signal, or Wire, or Facebook Messenger, or Twitter, or you know, Dropbox, or Gmail, or all the other systems where you can transfer files. But everybody has email. Even the young generation, and I'm 47, even the young generation have email today. Maybe they don't use it that much, but they need it. If you want to sign up for an account anywhere, you most probably need an email account. An email from the old days, that was when, when I was <coughs> young, and I'm not going to say anything about my but she, she was really young at the time. Um, Target and poop. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the old days, everybody was nice on, on the internet. You know, there were there, you know, there weren't no bad people on, on on the internet. And the worst that could happen is, you know, somebody would prank your computer if you left it. Uh, unlocked on your desktop and went for lunch and somebody would turn up the desktop upside down. That was like more or less the, the worst thing that could happen on, on, my, on the internet. Today it's not the same thing. And um, here's a very short list of the things that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to mention the NSF, as Anne-Marie has already talked about. I'm going to say something about SPF, DKIM, and uh, DMAR, and also Dane um, for, for DNS. Now, here's a, here's a s small chart I was trying to, to set up for you. <coughs> At the bottom, we have unencrypted protocols. You know HTTP. I really seriously hope you know HTTP. You should never use HTTP. You should be using HTTPS, right? Now, HTTPS can be secured in so many ways. We can add an HSTS header. HPKP, well, that's actually deprecated now, so don't use it anymore. We can add the TLSA records, and the point is, is to secure what people are using the World Wide Web. Now, we also have DNS on the bottom, and DNS is the phone book of the internet. You know, you call our DNS server and ask for the phone number, or IP address for a server because you have a name, <coughs> like looking at the Ubas web pages, that's not really type in ubas.org. Then you call a DNS server and ask what is the IP address and I'm going to give it back to you. The problem is you can't trust the phone book of the internet, which is called DNS, because it's clear text. 
and there's no digital signatures applied to those queries that you make and the responses you get back. So anyone being able to respond to your query, what is the IP address of the server, can give you back any IP address they want and redirect you to the wrong site. And this is not just for web pages. This applies for anything that uses DNS. So if you're transferring files using FTP, Telnet, or whatever protocol, they can spoof the response. They can give you a false response. And your computer will willingly accept that as the truth and connect to that IP address. That is an issue. We have server-to-server -server email communication, starting out with the really, really old protocol, SMTP. We can add start TLS encryption, which is opportunistic server-to-server -server encryption. It's a good start, and we'll talk about that. We can add SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. We can also add DENG, TLSA, eventually ARC and SMTP, STS. Lots of abbreviations there. But this, again, is about uh, securing email going from one server to another server. So this is not end-to-end -end encryption. This is not me encrypting my email on my computer and sending it to Anne-Marie, and then she can decrypt the email on her computer. This is just server-to-server -server communication. Mm -hmm. Then we also have the client-to-server, because you have an email client, and for the younger generation of you, that will be your web browser talking to Gmail. In the old days, we were using Mozilla Thunderbird, some people are using Microsoft Outlook, you know, good riddance, but some still do, actually, at that. And that is an email client talking to a server. And you can be using POP and IMAP protocols, which are, again, unencrypted, to download your emails from that server. We can add SSL, or TLS, as it's called today, to these protocols. We have secure POP and secure IMAP. A friend of mine, is working on something called require TLS, basically saying that I'm going to send an email and I'm requiring my mail server to send it to only to servers that do support start TLS. And if the remote server doesn't support start TLS, do not send the email. We can also <coughs> add Dane TLSA records in this as well. Dane TLSA is a record that we publish in DNS to make things more secure. And again, the purpose of this is to secure the connection between your client and the mail server you are using. So that's the basic chart of this. Now, start TLS starting out <coughs> dates back to many years ago, back to 2001. And I was here working for the ISP and phone connection provider Telenor in Norway back in 2001. I started there. And in 2004, in 2003, 2004, we were having a discussion internally at Telenor. We are sending lots of emails, and some of them actually do contain some you know, sensitive data. They are not government secrets, because that is something you're not allowed to send by email, but you know, they are sensitive to the company, like discussing with our lawyers or a contract and all kinds of documents that we do send out by email, and we don't want everyone to be able to see them to stop them, to change them, so that the decision makers at both ends suddenly get the wrong document and make the wrong uh, decisions. So we have discussion, should we do PGP? How many uses PGP today? <laughs> Shit. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and how many of you have tried to use PGP? What? Yeah. <laughs> I did use PGP, I don't anymore. And even the inventor of PGP says he doesn't use it anymore. For me, PGP is dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the funny thing is, back in 2004, when we were having this discussion, we thought that Tulano that, yeah, no, no, we're not going to enforce people to start learning PGP to use, to learn. PKI to learn, you know, what is your public certificate, what is your secret key and public key and so on. You know, we, we can't do that to all the employees of Telenor, but we need some way to do encryption. So suddenly there was a, friend, a colleague of mine who suggested, well, should we at least, you know, enforce start TLS, start using start TLS? And I looked into it in 2004 and we started implementing start TLS. And start TLS again can be illustrated that Here's my mail server, and this is your mail server. And I will 
make a connection to your mail server saying, hey, I have an email for you. And I get a response back saying, no, okay, pass it on, send me my, the email. And I will send the email, yep, here you go, here's the email, hello, all the contents, all the files, the attachments. And the server again, your server will respond back saying, yep, thanks, received everything, and okay, well, that's it, close connection. The contents have been transferred to your mail server. And all this, the problem is, this is unencrypted. Anyone listening to your line connection, be it on your local ethernet, be it somewhere on the internet, if they can get access to the cable where these data are flowing through, they can be eavesdropping <coughs> this connection. And that at least as a minimum, they can be looking at the contents because it's unencrypted. So what Stock TLS does is, pretty much the same process. Hey, I got an email for you. And the server, your server responds, oh, great, <coughs> you know, I support start TLS as well. So if you want to do that, we can switch into encrypted communication. Whoa! <laughs> and of course, obviously, my mail server supports start TLS as well. So I'm like, yeah, whoa, awesome. <laughs> and then we do encryption key exchange between those two servers. And after that, when we transfer like, this email is supposed to go to you and you and you, and here are the contents and these are the attachments, all that communication will be transferred encrypted. And this to the end users, this is completely transparent. They don't see this happening at all. But it's also opportunistic, meaning that, hey, I have email for you. And you respond back and you say, I've got encryption. And I'm like, what? Clueless. Then your mail server will respond back, well, that's fine, you know, just send it unencrypted instead. And the RFC for Start TLS specifically says that if you operate a server, a mail server on the internet, and you want to support Start TLS, you have to accept incoming and outgoing connections <coughs> with servers that do not support Start TLS. So again, the initial connection is unencrypted. Meaning that if there are bad guys somewhere in the process here, they can basically block the reply from your server saying, hey, I support mail encryption. They can just remove that part of the communication, and then the rest of the communication will still be unencrypted. The good thing about it is, is it's better than nothing. That's a simple thing about Start TLS. Skip these. Now, as I said, there are some challenges. It's opportunistic, and it's easy to intercept using middle attacks. There are also some problems like the mail server that supports encryption needs an encryption key. It needs a digital certificate, a TLS certificate. That certificate can be issued to anyone. It could be issued to, say, gmail.com. But since I'm using Gmail, I'm telling the world, hey, my mail server is gmail.com, but you're sending an email to peer at toolsim.net, my last name, which is my domain. Now, how can you possibly know that the certificate issued to gmail.com has anything to do with my domain? How can we authenticate the certificate? Because what we have now is an encrypted connection, but we also need to authenticate, like, yeah, I see it's encrypted, but you know, who the hell are you? I need to figure out who are you? And you should probably also figure out, who am I? Am I the one claiming to be the one I actually am? I'm going, coming back to Sartias a little bit later on, but one of the things we have also done at Knowledge Choice is to implement SPF, Sender Policy Framework. SPF is a whitelist of all the servers and external partners we use allowed to send email on our behalf using our domain names like choice.se or knowledgechoicehotels.se. It's a whitelist. What does it do? Well, let's say I'm going to send out marketing emails and I don't do that. I actually have an external company doing it for me. Let's call them ABC. Now, ABC have their own servers sending all out, all, out all these marketing emails. 
and I will put them into my SPF record, which is a list, a very short list of IP addresses, usually, or our DNS name, um, saying that ABC is allowed to send out emails into the world using choice.se as the standard domain. So you get an email from marketing at choice.se. When you do that, when you get the email, you can decide on your server, should I do a lookup of the SPF record for the domain choice.se? And if you do, you will see that ABC is listed as a company allowed to send mail on our behalf. So because I have whitelisted them, you can trust that, yes, this email is legitimate. This is actually supposed to come from choice. That's it. Very easy. And an SPF record, our domain in Norway, choice.no, and this is our SPF record. And this basically says that all the mail servers that I have are allowed to send email using at choice.no as the sender domain name. So the from address will be pair at choice.no. And this SPF record allows <coughs> our mail servers and nothing else to send mail using choice.no. So if your mail server. Yeah, question. Yeah. Can't, uh, uh, somebody in the middle do the whitelisting? Yes. Which is why we need DNSSEC. Mm. Coming in a few slides. Okay. <laughs> but I'll give it away now. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's fine. <laughs> now, this isn't reliable either because, as an example, the SPF lookup is a DNS lookup. You ask my DNS server, hey, uh, I need to check the uh, SPF list of choice with MO because ABC is trying to send us some emails and, and they are saying that you know these emails are coming from choice and we want to have a look up, up uh, of the SPF record. That's a DNS lookup and everyone doing man in the middle can then provide a falsified SPF record back to you and then you will Oh, yeah, it's fine. They are listed in the whitelist, so we'll accept the email for delivery to our users. <coughs> but there are also some other examples of SPF. This is one, uh, a news article in, in Norway back in, in 2017. Made big headlines. Thousands of Norwegian companies have been, uh, you know, are the victims of email chaos after a Norwegian ISP was blocked by Google. And it's like, yeah, but Google is evil, right? You know, they block everyone and everything and whatever would they do. But what actually happened is, this ISP in Norway, they were running more than, I, uh, I think it was, yeah, 3,000 companies in Norway, they were hosting them. And they did have an SPF record <coughs> where they had whitelisted all their own IP addresses, saying that for all our 3,000 customers, our mail servers are allowed to send mail on behalf of those, of those customers. But suddenly, the ISP changed the IP addresses of their servers. But they didn't update the whitelist. So then suddenly, the ISP had blacklisted their own servers, or every other server in the world. And absolutely no email were delivered to Google because when Google receives an email, they will check to see if you have an SPF record and they will check to see if that is correct. Comment, not anymore unless you use the Mac. Hmm? Not anymore unless you use the Mac. Yeah, they use the Mac as well. And no, 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 not as well. If you only have SPF, yeah. Google will just ignore it nowadays. Same with Yahoo. Yeah. And there's more coming. More, more slides coming. <laughs> more slides coming. Because, again, SPF by itself is not considered good enough anymore. And you should do SPF, but you can't just rely on SPF by itself. So somebody also came up with DKIM, which is basically adding a digital signature to the email sent, being sent out. It's not encryption, like the contents are still fully readable you can add a digital signature to the email. And this verifies that the, uh, uh, you put on a, 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 a digital signature saying that this email originates from choice.no. 
and we publish a DKIM record in our DNS so that when you receive the email, oh, yeah, ooh, nice, it's digitally signed, and it says choice Leno. Well, then you do a lookup in DNS and check to see if our published DKIM key is, corresponds with the one being used to sign the email. Uh, if, if, the, if it cor corresponds, then you have received an email coming from choice. And this is also pretty good. One of the things you can use this for is, here's an example, uh, one of the things you can use DKIM for, and then again is, uh, it's interesting that you know, the SPF is, is the whitelisting part, but DKIM is, in a way, better because it's a digital signature, and, and making a fraudulent digital signature is, it can be done, but you know, it's more like the NSA can do it. It's not like something you can do that easily. But that's only for integrity, then. It's in integrity, yes, but it does verify the central domain, and it can also be uh, applied to the the, um, the mail header or the um, contents of email, or both. Yeah, but yeah. It's still, uh, it doesn't satisfy anything with the confidentiality. No, no, no. This is just integrity. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 authenticity. So in Norway, as an example, there's this document, which is uh, in, in, uh, in English, this is like the best practice for information security within the public health sector. Hospitals, doctors and so on in Norway, they don't have to be compliant with this. This is a recommendation, but there are many hospitals and many government organizations in the health sector that are cooperating in this document and, and the corresponding documents. And they have uh, a very uh, interesting paragraph saying that if there is a need for it, the message or email should be signed in such a way that the organization who sent it cannot deny having sent the email. That's interesting because SPF doesn't help with you with this, but DKIM does help with this. And we have seen examples. Here's a friend of mine, Robert Graham, Rota Security. He wrote that back in 2016. PolitiFact, yes, we can fact check Kane's email. This is related to the WikiLeaks leak of, of DNC, Clinton, Podesta emails and so on that WikiLeaks published online. It was like, well, there's a lot of emails here. And are these actually from, 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 from Ms. Clinton? Are these actually from Podesta and from Kane? Well, they were because those emails that were leaked contained a DKIM signature and the signature that had been used for all these emails corresponded with the key they had published in their DNS. So that is like proof <coughs> that these emails originated from the DNC, which was really interesting to find out. But obviously there are challenges with DKIM as well something as simple as, and I see this with some of my providers as well, for marketing the email. They put in, in the SPF record, or in my SPF record, I have listed ABC, they are allowed to send email on my behalf in my SPF, but then they send out an email with a DKIM signature, and that DKIM signature contains their name, not my name, it should be my name. So when you receive the email, you have a conflict. The SPF says ABC has uh, permission to send email on my behalf using my name, and you see they are using my name, and you find it in my SPF record. At the same time, the email has a digital signature containing their name <coughs> instead. And then you have, well, are we going to trust SPF or are we going to trust DKIM? That's an issue, and there are many other issues as well. So, somebody implemented DMARC. And DMARC again. Yep. And also use as the main record in order to point to the SPF record, sorry, to the DMARC record now, to the DKIM record of ABC company. Yeah, the DKIM signature said ABC. Mm -hmm. I want it to be me. No, if you remove the domain of the signature, then it gets second with the one of the envelope. So you can set up a C name that points towards the ABC. Technical DKIM. discussion afterwards. Yes, mm -hmm. I know. You can do that. Uh, so DMARC again is publishing a policy where I tell you in my DMARC policy that, hey, if you receive an email, 
uh, you know, I do recommend you to look up my SPF record, and I also recommend you to look up the DKIM signature. And based on what you decide to do, I want you to send me a report back on what did you choose to do with that email. Or a little bit more simplified, what we do today, we are using DMARC policies for, for knowledge choice hotels. And I can say that on any given day or in a week, we see somewhere between 50,000 emails and half a million emails being sent from other people in the world that we have no agreement with and are trying to send out emails that looks like they do originate from knowledge choice hotels. There's a lot of spam. All sorts of the Viagra scam, the casino scam, all kinds of scams. But because we have a DMAR policy, because if you have SPF and DMAR, you're just telling the world about your security. But you don't get any feedback back from them. You know, what did you actually choose to do with all those fake emails coming in and with the real emails coming from us? With a DMAR policy, you will start sending me reports back to me once every 24 hours, say, hi there. So uh, we received like 2,000 emails yesterday that said they were coming from Choice of Dano. 500 of those were correct because they had SPF correct or, D or DKIM correct or both. And the remaining 1,500, yeah, well, they come from, they, you know, they come from Iran, they come from Malaysia, they come from North Korea, they come from China, they come from Sweden, uh, they come from Denmark, they came from absolutely everywhere. And what we did, because of your DMARC policy, we just deleted them. They were never delivered to the final recipient. So by having a DMARC policy, we are actively assisting in reducing spam on the internet. Now, does your organization have a DMARC policy published? Because if you don't, you are part of the problem, you are not part of the solution. And a DMARC policy, again, can be a very simple text line. A single text line published in DNS. So here's a blog post from uh, HMRC Digital. Those are uh, the UK organization that you know are collecting taxes from people in the UK. And they put out on um, a blog post saying that after setting up a DMARC policy for one year, they saw that they had discovered more than 14,000 phishing web pages. And not only did they find them, they also were able to stop them, take them down. And all those web pages were pages like, you know, you have money left on your tax return. So you know, just go onto this web page and type in your secret, you know, account number and credit card number and your CVV and your phone name and expiry date on your card, and we will send you your five thousand Swedish krona back again. They discovered fourteen thousand web pages after publishing a DMARC uh, record and reading those reports coming in. And not only that, they also received more than 300,000 emails from people. Hey, I, I, there's something wrong here. I think I have received a phishing email. And because of your DMARC policy, because of your SPF and DKIM policy, I think it, it's, it's spam. So they received it and they handled it. And last but not least, they saw that because they had an active DMARC <coughs> policy saying that if you receive an email trying to look like it came from us collecting taxes or returning taxes and so on, if SPF and DKIM is not correct, just delete it. Because of that policy, in one year, they reduced the number or they at least deleted more than 300 million phishing emails being sent out to people in the UK. 300 million spam mails were stopped. That's pretty good. And we, at Only Choice Hotels, we stop, as I said, between 50,000 and 500,000 emails every week because of our demo. It's a lot. Here's a demo example for, my, for myself. Two lines or one single line in DNS. It's now, when you know how to do this, it's that easy, incredibly easy. And, you, and this is not something you have to change like every day or anything like that. Most probably you, you would have to change this like once every two years or something. Okay. So it's absolutely well worth it. 
and when I sell that, because I have a personal domain, kursen.net, that's my personal domain, and I sort of myself, well, it's it's my domain, and I'm not, I mean, I'm using it for my personal email, and that's it, you know, not even my, you know, not even my 12-year-old daughter is using the same domain for email or anything else. So I thought, that, well, do I need SPF Decommedia Mark? Nah, I, it's like, you know, <laughs> why would we you try to abuse my domain for sending out spam and, and Viagra spam and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, again, just to learn how this stuff works, I did configure SPF DKM and DMR for my own domain. And, uh, whoo, like in 24 hours, like I'm getting reports back saying Vietnam is sending out emails from Tursen.net. China is sending out emails from Tursen.net. Sweden! Sweden! Of all the countries <laughs> in the world, Sweden is trying to fish me! All my friends or family or whatever. <coughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> but that was an interesting discovery. Like, yep, I'm just me, my domain, not being used for anything. And even my domain was trying, you know, they were trying to abuse it. <coughs> so, of course, I implemented the strictest policy po possible, saying that anything from anyone except my mail server, spam, deleted. Period. Very effective. But then again, SPF, DKIM and DMR relies upon DNS. And as Almarie have already told you, DNS is not reliable for security or for authenticity or authentication. So we add DNSSEC. And then we add these electronic signatures to the query and to the response or the responses that we get back. Funny observation, Sweden, of course, well, congratulations, Sweden, you were the first in the world to do this. Uh, Norway was a little bit behind. But funny observation, all the ISPs that I have checked in Norway, all the large ones, Telia, Telenor, and many other providers as well, all of them now are providing you a DNS server that does DNSSEC resolution. So when you made a, make a query, they will respond back and they will check the authenticity of the response using the NASA. To the major banks, most of the Norwegian government, like, well, anyone really in Norway, of companies and organizations, they haven't signed their domains yet. Not the big ones, not the newspapers, not the TV stations, not the banks, insurance companies, hospitals. And it's, again, you know, it's, as I say, you know, as soon as you understand how to do it, it's that easy to do. And together with Anmali and together with quite a few others as well, we are fighting the world, <laughs> trying to make everyone to sign their friggin' domains with DNS. Because all the users, all your users at home or using a cell phone today, they are ready, they have DNS support. But you have to sign your domain as well to make, you know, the final step to make this all a lot more secure. At Knowledge Hotels, we have signed our domains. I am talking to two hotels, I'm talking to Scanic Hotels, I'm talking to Radisson Hotels at the moment now. And they also agree, yeah, it sounds smart, yeah. Uh, we, you know, we have actively started in doing this. I've tried talking to the banks and so on, they're like, nah, we are using bank ID, that's secure. Oh, fuck, you don't understand shit. That's something completely different. Sorry for the language, I'm Norwegian. <laughs> so the NS second option, as you can see, Norway is green, Sweden is green. Don't deal. So it's no more discussion on that. We are <laughs> equal, at least. And Iceland. And Iceland. <laughs> and Iceland. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, how do we, you know, make companies and organizations do this? You know, I'm just, you know, I just say I'm, I'm a guy living on the west coast of Norway in the city of Bergen, just like, I want the NSSEC, I want you to, I want it now. And they're, they're like, we couldn't care about you. you know, shut up, you're from Bergen. <coughs> <laughs> and I really like the approach they have done in the Netherlands. Because of the, the government in the Netherlands, they have lots of standards, and one of the standards they do recommend is to use the NSSEC. And some other stuff as well. And some time ago, in 2016, they said, hey, new email security protocols mandatory within government. But mandatory isn't like an order. You have to do it. I really like their approach. They say that <coughs> here's a standard, and you should implement it. 
but you don't have to. But if you choose not to configure the NASAC or SPF or DK Modima, which, you know, again, can be a simple text line, you have to write a fucking PhD dissertation explaining why you choose not to do it <laughs> and send it to the government. So, choice is yours. Four friggin' lines of text or a PhD dis dissertation. It's like, you know, even management gets that. It's, it's, you know, it's easy to understand. Just do it. I will make the world better. <clears throat> so going back to start TLS, that was the outbreak in the beginning. <coughs> when I was working for EDB, EDB Business Partner, which is now today known as Avri, we made a little bit of research in 2010. We were looking at Norwegian domains and other domains in other countries and their adoption of start TLS. And what we found is that the Norwegian Prime Minister at the time, Jan Stoltenberg, if you wanted to send an email to him, their mail server had a digital certificate. So yes, they had Start TLS support. And we were like, yes, the Prime Minister's office has Start TLS. That's a good start. I mean, we can tell everybody else in the public sector, the Prime Minister does it, so you should do it as well. And then we looked at the certificate of the server. And it was the default demo certificate saying, hi, and welcome to Cisco Systems in California, USA. <laughs> and it's like, so I, I, I called Dagen Snags, the, the largest financial newspaper in Norway, and like, you know, I do have a story for you. And that was the Prime Minister's office is using fake ID. <laughs> hey, hey, I, I made a lot of enemies that day. <laughs> because obviously I was interviewed in this as well. And not, not only that, but because another thing that we found as well is that we have socialist Venster Party. They, they are far left in Norway. And they are communists, but they are most definitely uh, very socialistic. And they also had Star TLS support, one of the few political parties that had Star TLS support. And they had a certificate as well. <coughs> and that had been issued to the office of complications of things that are actually rather easy. Something like that. It's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and and some, again, some of these reports, again, like, the socialists have a certificate saying that, you know, welcome to the office that are really making stuff difficult, which is supposed to be easy. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense <laughs> for them. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm unusual, but they really enjoy that. But what I also did, I talked to a friend of mine in, in Oslo, and we made a small service called StartTLS.info. It doesn't exist anymore. It has served its purpose. But what we do, did is you could just type in a <coughs> domain on anyone, and we will check does the domain and the mail service of that domain, do they have StartTLS support? And if they do have StartTLS support, check to see how well it's implemented, and then we gave it a score from A to F. A, perfect, congratulations, absolutely excellent. F, well, you do have StartTLS support, but I mean, like, you know, friggin' hell, it's like completely wrong configure. And we made this, and, and we said, hey, I, I don't want to use this and check your domains and so on. And then I talked to uh, some people on Twitter, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so I talked to one guy there, and he is, by education, a lawyer. And he was, at the time, working for the American Civil Liberties Union, which is equivalent to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's, you know, human rights, it's people's rights in the US. And he really liked this, because it's like, type in domain name, wait a couple of seconds, and boom, you have a score. A to F or fail, you don't have something less support. And one of the things he did, he used this and he typed in apple.com or me.com, which is also the domain being used by Apple. And it said, boom, no start TLS support. And that happened, I think it was in 2014 or something, like 11, 12, 13 years after the RFC actually appeared. So he told me that, you know, Pev, I, I called the legal department of Apple, and I said, hey, this is the ACLU, you know us, and you really care about privacy, but you don't support an RFC standard that will provide much better privacy for everybody on the internet, 
and it's a standard that has existed as an RFC now for 13 years, and there are no competing standards, it's very easy to implement, and uh, you know, I'm going to give you a heads up before we publish something online saying Apple doesn't support this. Apple implemented support for Start TLS for all the domains, all the, the servers over the entire world in 72 hours. <laughs> Winning. <laughs> And that's just one. They also call Microsoft and Facebook and some other people as well. So one of the things that happened is that the uh, head of security at the time at Facebook, he sent me an email and said, nicely done guys, really, really good. And then I received an email from somebody at Google as well. Awesome work, starty less, great stuff. And both of them said, hey, do you have an by a chance, do you have an account number that we can send some money to? Couple of days, $15,000. We <laughs> <laughs> Now, I started you know, working with Start TLS, trying to get everyone to use it in 2004. And in 2014, I received $15,000. So per hour is, <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know, the workforce is pretty expensive in Norway. So I, I'm going to complain, but it's like, yeah. Anyway, Google do uh, publish the uh, monthly transparency report that you can find online. And one of the things that they, they do, they will add incoming email to Google and outgoing email, and they will give you graphs saying how much of that email is now using StartTLS. Now, before we started StartTLS.info, we saw an adoption of 21, 22% 20 uh, on the internet. This uh, picture now is pretty old, and it says 87% on outbound and 81% on incoming emails to Google. Numbers now are even a lot higher. So the major vast majority of email on the internet now is being <coughs> encrypted when it, it's being transferred from one mail server to the next server. And there's a lot of email being encrypted. And we have also seen, because when you do implement Start TLS support, one of the things we did suddenly find out, uh, did find out is that when you have support for it, <coughs> you will suddenly see who does not have support for it, that's one. Even more interesting, you will also see that somebody has stopped he has support, and then suddenly it goes away. And if it suddenly goes away, somebody removed it, and that it's not probably A or B, that's a man in the middle attack. And at one point, it was discovered that there were some um, uh, problems in, in Thailand and because of that, Google suddenly saw that almost all email coming to Google from Thailand suddenly didn't use Start TLS anymore. That was a state level, man in the middle downgrade attack on email going on. You don't know who did it, most probably the Thai government, but almost all email leaving Thailand for Google suddenly was stripped for, from encryption using Start TLS. And in another case, a broadband provider in the US was caught removing all <coughs> Start TLS connections for the customers. The only reason that makes sense, and as they were cooperating with the National Security Agency, is that they were decrypting your emails or removing the encryption of your emails in order to read your emails for marketing purposes. Because we do know, well, not in Sweden, not in Norway, I hope, but we do know that in quite a few countries, and especially the US, your internet provider will read your emails. According to the legal statements in the contract, they are allowed to read your email to provide you with a better service. That's called providing you with more marketing materials. That's. So the National Security Authority of Norway has published guidelines for e email encryption. Uh, we saw a couple of years ago that the uh, Financial Supervisory Authority of Norway sent out to all banks and financial institutions, here is the guideline from National Security Authority, and we want you to implement Start TLS support, period, and they have done so. We also saw that the Department of, of Knowledge and Education, they also sent out a, a letter to universities and all high schools in Norway saying, here is the guideline from the National Security Authority, and we want you to implement support for this. Period. And this is uh, uh, back in 2014 and in 2013, 
And at the time, I was like, yes, really happy, and some money from Facebook and Google as well for a small party. And we could also proclaim that while Norway, Norwegian government, suddenly became the first government in the world saying, oh, the RFC standard for Star TLS, yes, we recommend that for all government agencies in Norway, period. And I think we were the first country in the world to do that. Now, I didn't stop there. So back in January this year, again, another victory, working with this stuff since 2004, so that's 15 years, the directorate for uh, anything IT and stuff and like that in the Norwegian government, they published new guidelines. And new guidelines now says that if you are a public sector, we recommend it's not like an order you have to do, but we highly recommend you to use DNSSEC, SPF, DKIM, DMARC, and also something called Dane TLSA, and TLS reporting. So now the government recommends it, and now there's just a small job left to do, and that is to make everyone actually implement it. <laughs> Correct, that, that's, that's a small part. <laughs> so 15 years in and going strong on this. So now I'm gonna shut up for a little while, you get to stand up and move around, ask questions or anything that, like that, and then I will do the fun talk. <laughs> that I, I'm saving that one for, for last. So feel free to, uh, well, how long are we doing? You know? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay.